there was a lot of talk after the World Cup last year that the NWSL, it's too transitional, it's too vertical. They're, you know, those players are never going to succeed in a major tournament. Or there was the argument that, you know, the U.S. was not developing players correctly or the U.S. needs to completely change their style of play in order to find success. Whereas I would say over the last two games, it's been a bit, so just some kind of true blue <laughs> U.S. Women's National Team grit and guts that have gotten them through the knockout rounds. The traditional world football powers don't always, don't always make it to the top. You can be the best team of a tournament and still not make it all the way to the to the final and I, I just think it's a good reset it's a good reset going into a number of years without a major world tournament hello everybody and welcome to another special youtube edition of the late sub i am your host claire watkins it is early evening here in chicago on tuesday august 6th we have our bronze and gold medal Olympic soccer games set, and we need to talk about it because, oh boy, dream final, dream final, yes or no, anybody? The United States will be playing Brazil for a gold medal on Saturday. Spain will be taking on Germany for bronze. So we're going to start talking about the United States game, and then we'll talk a little bit about Brazil's major upset of Spain, how it all happened, what we think for the final, goods, bads, positives, worries, all of that good stuff. So I think we should just go ahead and start with the United States defeating Germany. This was the rematch of their Group B second game in the group stage. People remember the United States won that game four to one. A little bit tougher sledding this time. They defeat Germany one to nothing in extra time. Yes, they go to extra time once again after doing so against Japan. Oh, I have many big picture thoughts about this game. And I keep saying this, it's like you want to get technical, but I the more I watch this game or even before this game when when or the beginning where maybe it was beginning to be defined by missed chances by the United States because the United States runs out again sort of this exact same starting 11. The only two changes they make is they put Tierna Davidson back in the back and they put Sam Coffey back in the defensive midfield. So Sam Coffey returns from her yellow card accumulation suspension. Tierna Davidson returns from her knee contusion, though Davidson does need to be subbed out at halftime. So not entirely sure exactly how fit Davidson was. She looked sharp at the beginning, though, sharp enough to, to get close to, to the opener in like the second minute of the game. Roosevelt comes close to the opener in the fourth minute of the game. There's a couple of chances in that first 10 minutes that make you think, oh, my gosh, the United States is about to roll all over Germany again. That does not happen. The game is tight. It is end to end. Both teams have chances. I think we're going to be calling out individual players again in this kind of analysis point because structurally, yes, the United States did some good things, but it wasn't really the structure that won this game. It was individuals stepping up, sort of a gutsy performance for the United States. But maybe that's the place to start, right? The lack of rotation is both, you know, the United States... It's, it's their consistency and it's their struggle, right? It's, it's what's carried them through this tournament and it's what's holding them back. It is both things at once. Hayes, once again, just pretty much asking that front three of Swanson, Smith, and Rodman to figure it out, trusting the, the leadership and the experience of Haran and Lavelle in front of Coffey, basing basically the entire game plan <laughs> as it stood against the continued excellence of Naomi Gurma. And she stepped up once again, and then you trust Nair in net. So... Again, structurally for the United States, there were some tiny changes. It was a little bit of a flatter formation than we saw against Germany in their first matchup against them. It was less of that 4-2-3-1. It was a little bit more of straight lines. You saw higher, faster tempo. You saw them try to push a little bit more. Very, very different than the Japan game, despite the result being very similar. Things were open. And when you look at lack of control due to fatigue, sometimes that can result in a game like the Japan game where the United States is on the ball and recycling the ball over and over again and is very boring and they're having trouble to score. Or you could have a game like this one where both teams are certainly pushing. Like the, the effort was there and the attempt to push tempo was there. But again, the control is not, which is how you end up seeing some mistakes in the back. You see players not quite the touch that won again those missed chances at the beginning of the game for the U.S. And I think maybe that's sort of indicative of what 
should have been expected from the Japan game to the Germany game to what's going to be this Brazil game in the gold medal match is just, yes, I, I, we mentioned this before in the, the first Germany game, which is just the United States kind of created their own luck in that match. They went up early and they scored on a lot of chances and they got the rebounds and they got the deflections that they needed and they got the right bounces on the other end. They were able to change the game state early and that made their lives easier in this game call it fatigue, call it luck, call it just, you know, when you play the same team twice, things are going to be different. They did not have those game-changing moments at the beginning, which in a vacuum, not a huge deal, but it did slowly turn this game into more of a grind, which as we know with some of the fatigue issues that the team is dealing with, doesn't always set them up to succeed. I would say, you know, the lack of control in the midfield was perhaps that it's almost most apparent in this game. We we discussed some of the lack of control in ball progression against Japan because of how little Japan was pushing on the ball. Germany, once again, puts a lot of pressure on that midfield. I thought actually Coffee did, did very well in this game. She was not progressing the ball as much, but all of her defensive actions, I think, were very sound. Haran and Lavelle struggled again. That was not particularly useful. It did force the front line to kind of create their own magic sometimes. It did force the back line into struggles to sort of keep the keep Germany contained. I, I don't really know what to say about Haran that maybe hasn't already been said on this podcast. I think Haran is a player that has, again, gutsy. She's giving everything that she possibly can. She's played a hell of a lot of minutes for this team. People ask questions still about sort of that knee injury, the knee tape that she's been carrying for a long time. And the more and more she gets fatigued, the bigger an issue it becomes. Now, I do want to focus in on one Haran thing. I think maybe the biggest moment of the game was the free kick that she kind of pinged right off of her teammate, right? She pings the free kick off of Rose Lavelle while the U.S. is looking for the opener. The U.S. getting all of these free kicks was not a surprise or kind of random. Germany came in with a huge emphasis on physicality. They were missing even more of their top line stars in this game. They were missing Alexandra Pop. They were missing Leah Schuler. They came in to try to muddy things up. They wanted to put pressure on that midfield. And it's not totally dissimilar to what they were trying to do in the group stage game. Force turnovers, move the ball quickly, make the U.S. pay on the other end. And, and so the U.S. was winning. They were winning free kicks. They were winning set pieces. And and you heard over and over and over again from the from the broadcast about how much the U.S. has struggled on set pieces or on free kicks. And it is true that like Lindsay Horan is not going to kick the ball into the goal from a, a direct free kick anytime soon, it seems like. But you keep looking for the set piece design to change. You keep looking for the ability to punch things in on corners. I think that the United States, I think they've been very maligned for their set pieces. And I think the their inability to convert is an issue. Some of the set piece design, I think, has been decent. I liked that corner kick that they did against Japan. Not to advocate for short corners, but the one where they got Mallory Swanson into her preferred shooting position at the top of the box. I don't think that's a bad idea. I've discussed again in the past that they don't have a huge aerial presence on set pieces. There isn't sort of an obvious player to lob the ball into. And obviously if Haran is on the ball, then she's not going to be the target. All of these different things leading to a little bit of a miscommunication in when you're in the later part of a tournament could be your life-saving play. And certainly you you keep waiting for Germany's approach, their hyper-physical approach to, to bite them, right? To be sort of them writing their own ending, but the U.S. isn't able to make them pay. And so that is sort of, it'll be really fascinating if the United States does pull this off and the United States does win a gold medal with their lack of effectiveness on set pieces in this tournament, it's going to be pretty incredible <laughs> to be honest. And in a testament in some ways to the attack and, and, and to what they've been able to do goal scoring, but in other ways, it's just not the way I think the team wants to play, nor is it a, a consistent way to succeed later and later into the knockout rounds of an international tournament. So I, I don't know. I go back and forth on, I don't think all of the set piece design is bad. I think that they have a legitimate issue just sort of with, again, that aerial presence, that physicality on set pieces. But I also just don't think Haran is necessarily helping with her particular approach. And, and those are sort of those compounding issues that you watch a game like this with every minute that passes and every kind of missed opportunity where they start with missed full opportunities and they turn into missed half opportunities. And then Germany starts getting these opportunities on the other end things get to get a little touchy, right? It starts to feel like that bad luck creeping in that maybe we saw more during the Andonovsky era. However, again, late stage rounds of an international tournament. I always just say that when you get through this, I mean, it's kind of like I said with the Japan game, better to win this game than to lose it. You just see individual players step up. You see, you know, I think the U.S. got bailed out multiple times by Naomi Gurma. Her stats in this game were impeccable. She 
you know, she completed 95% of her passes. She created chances. She, she passed into the final third. There was that one head. Oh God, there was that one header in the first half. That was just so like the, the aerial clearances really, really impressive. And, and Nair, Alyssa Nair also had a very quality game in net, even before the crazy kick save at the end of the game. So I think I've said this before where we've had sort of these lopsided performances because the midfield hasn't really been effective since let's say the Zambia game, which is not great, but that's also just sort of at this point, the definition of who this team is at this moment, right? Hayes has not had enough time to greatly affect the style of play in the midfield. She has not necessarily had a chance to make huge changes in the midfield. Don't know if that's been affected by fitness or not. Jaden Shaw, once again, did not get into this match. Not entirely sure why, if she is fit, if she's not fit that, you know, that's just the roll of the dice, right? So the defense has to hold up because there are going to be turnovers in the midfield. And even Rodman, who is is generally a lot better about this, but as she tires, she starts turning the ball over a little bit more. Swanson, when she tires, she starts turning the ball over a little bit more. And the ref was not calling a ton of fouls, despite there being a lot of fouls in the game. So the defense steps up. So Gurma plays incredibly well. I mean, Hayes, after the game, says that Gurma is the best defender that she's ever seen in her entire life. And I am inclined to agree. I mean, it's 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 wild. Again, you can talk about the issues with the program or the issues with the pipeline, but the U.S. keeps generating these generational players and that can carry you through a tournament, right? Gurma, incredible. Emily Sonnet comes in for Davidson at halftime and does an admirable job. You see Nyswanger come in for Dunn, does an admirable job. Emily Fox, after having sort of an injury scare, goes the distance for, for the U.S. Or, or goes most of the distance for the U.S. in, in this game and, and plays very well. And Nair, again, comes up when she needs to. And Germany's fatigue actually showed as well. It wasn't that Germany, it's like almost like their system was working better. The way that they wanted to play was generating those chances for them, but they just were not able to execute. And it just sort of reminds you that fatigue goes both ways, right? We have been very critical of, of Hayes' inability to rotate. And I think that carries all the way into this gold medal match and beyond. But, you know, the grueling tournament is a grueling tournament and you can play it perfectly. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to go all the way. So for the first 90 minutes of this match, the defense does their job, you know, base it on Germa, base it on Nair. The defense is the team or is the part of the team keeping the U.S. in this game based on defense. Defense wins championships, right? In extra time, the attack, which I said this about Trinity Robin in the Japan game, but like doubly so for Swanson and for Smith in the attack and in extra time, they go from from nothing, gas empty. There's nowhere to go. They're struggling with their touch. They're struggling with their runs to Swanson putting together the perfect ball and Smith. This is not even the best chance that Smith had in the game. She's got a defender closing on her and the goalkeeper and she chips it in the air, sends it into the back of the net. Suddenly the United States is in a very similar position as they were in the Japan game. They just have to see out the second half of extra time and they don't have to go to penalties. They do that successfully. Game one, the U S moves on. So like I said, I, I, I think just the team is who they are. Hayes is also just who she is. Hayes is not going to rotate. I don't expect her to rotate for a gold medal game. She's going to let these players go in, win or lose. The midfield is what it is. I mean, this was honestly the first game where I was watching this midfield and I went, I don't know who in this group necessarily. It, it starts to feel like these are performances where you might have to re-audition once you have younger players stepping up. So very curious to see what the long-term implications of the midfield are, but they're also, I don't think going to rotate in the gold medal game. That's the midfield. That's the U S midfield. U S defense done. I think has put a her Herculean shift in at that lap back position. I think Gurma has been very steady. And the only major question is just fitness for the other center back role, right? Fox has been very good. And Nair has been very good. So that is that that's the team. And in the Olympics, sometimes all you need to do is just hold on long enough to make it to the end and you just point to the scoreboard and you say the only stat that matters is one to nothing. And that is kind of where the United States is. Now, the one final thing I want to say about the U.S. before we even get to the gold medal match, because who knows how that goes, Brazil is going to be a formidable opponent. But, you know, in sort of this another hats off, hats off moment for the U.S., even again, they str you struggle cohesion, you can get into all of it, rotation, fatigue. But if they went into this tournament wanting to be feared again, right, by the rest of the world, I mean, let's look at it, right? Zambia plays plays the U.S. kind of straight up. They they lose, right? They lose through to nothing. Germany runs sort of the same game plan, but they play the U.S. straight up. They lose four to one. And then the negative play begins, right? Australia plays this kind of five back, five, four, one, real negative aspect, like trying to just hold the U.S. off 
the U.S. wins two to one, right? Japan plays a very negative off the ball game. They have the five back for the whole game. They're very conservative going forward. It takes a while for the U.S. to break through, but they break through one to nothing. Germany, I think kudos to Germany. Again, they kind of play the U S straight up. Once again, the U S fatigue, they win one to nothing, but Germany also comes in with a very physical game plan, right? Already sort of immediately disruptive. Germany is thinking from a disruptive point. So how do you, how do you quantify fear? Right. And I'm not even, I'm not even sure that's the right word necessarily, but you watch Australia go very negatively. You watch Japan go very negative formationally. You watch Germany come in just with a highly physical disruptive game plan. Isn't that tactically what fear looks like, right? Isn't that tactically what being considered a formidable opponent looks like rather than thinking that they can get one kind of slip one over on the U S like we saw in with Sweden in the Tokyo game, Sweden came in being like, you don't know what we've got coming for you. You think you know what we got, but you don't know what we got. That was the Sweden approach. That is just kind of how the U.S., on the other hand, has approached this tournament. And you're seeing reactive game plans from the other teams that they're playing rather than the U.S. having to do the reactive game plan. And that is the vibe shift for me. And I know that this isn't technical analysis, but the Olympics at this point is pure vibes. That's how you win. And that's the vibe shift. If you are the proactive team and the teams that you are playing are taking reactive tactics and they're taking team specific tactics in a way that doesn't always just focus on what they think they can do to succeed. Is that fear, respect, determination? Like that has to feel like the change. And the individuals in the United States are responding in kind. Germ over three games, or you could even argue five, right? Or you talk about Rodman or Smith or Swanson getting that final moment in extra time. There's a faith that they are going to work through the problem. There is a level of control of games with the clean sheeps that they're notching. Again, Germa being massive, that they feel like they can work their way into games if they miss a chance they're, they're remaining calm. They're going for the next one. If a game finishes in regulation, nil-nil, they go, okay, let's go. We're going to get it in extra time. That faith, you do credit it to the coach, but it also just is a credit to to the players and, and the newfound confidence that they feel in themselves and the pride that they feel in playing for the crest. And that was always there, but they're just having an easier time. They're having an easier time having that be facilitated. So does the U.S. win gold? I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I think they have to obviously feel good about the road that got them there. I think they have to feel good about the fact that they have won all of these games. Some of them have taken extra time, but they have not had to go to penalties yet. They've yet to drop a result in these Olympic games. They have to feel good that it's a, an, an opponent that they know very well, though, again, Brazil played fabulously against Spain. And, and so when you look at the larger job done, by my money... U.S. fans might not agree with me, but this has been a wildly successful tournament for the United States. Have there been some limitations in rotation? Absolutely. Do I think that that should be the way they approach a World Cup? I'm not sure. Are there major roster questions coming out of this? Yeah. There has not been a huge trust in the bench, and I think that some of the starters haven't stepped up, so what do you do, right? But I, I just think this has been a massively resurgent tournament for the United States, and they should feel so, so, so good. And I keep saying that, but I still think it's true, no matter what happens on Saturday. The fact that they have put themselves in a position to be disappointed by a silver medal is a ridiculously well job done. And again, the way you are seeing these games being played, I think, indicates that the respect on the world stage is there. Now, talking about another team where the respect on the world stage is there and you don't always get the ball to bounce your way, Spain gets dismantled by Brazil today. Brazil wins this game 4-2. to two. At one point, they were up 3 to nothing, and then it was 3-1, to one, and then it was 4-1, to one, and then it ended 4-2. to two. Spain's defense just gets completely ripped apart in this game. It looked like they were not ready. They, they were still on the bus when the game started. There was a... a pretty calamitous own goal to open the game. Again, we talk about how the game states change things in, in these sort of short form tournaments. And, and then they got ripped apart again for to go down two nothing. They go down three, nothing. Caroline comes in to sort of ice the game with that four one when, when Spain was making a push late, I think people maybe just kind of overlooked the Spain result against Colombia, that two, two result that went into penalties and Spain advanced on penalties. You think, Oh, maybe that's the wake up call. Honestly, in the Olympics, I'm not sure there's enough time for a wake-up call. Wake-up calls are when you have time to, to rest and recover and regroup. The Olympics is too fast and furious. Usually, if you start moving on that downward trajectory, that is a tough thing to bounce back from, except 
Brazil did it. Brazil loses two games in a row in the group stage. They finished third in their group in group C. They ride the wave all the way to the gold medal game. They're playing for Marta. They didn't have Marta the last two games. They have players going down with injury. But once they open things up, they're just playing that pure Brazilian football. Not to say that the defense is perfect, but it has certainly been good enough. They do enough to hold France off. They win late in that one in regulation. They win in this game in regulation, too. They're going to have a huge fitness advantage over the United States going into this gold medal game. And they are playing for Marta, talk about the galvanizing force of sending the greatest, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, arguably, off into the sunset internationally with an Olympic gold medal, which would be the first time the Brazilian women would have won any major tournament. That would be incredible. And I think for, for United States fans, or at least, again, I can maybe just speak for myself. I think whoever wins this gold medal game, you just have to think of it as a huge, huge, huge success, both for Brazil kind of turning the page. And, you know, you talk about Marta, her impassioned plea in 2019 of cry at the beginning so you can smile after. And then now in 2024, seeing that next generation of players carrying her to the gold medal match after serving her suspension, you see the difficulties kind of ring true of how hard it is to win a world cup. And then the next year win an Olympic medal or Olympic gold medal. It has never been done. You maybe look more kindly at some of these German or some of these American teams in the past who weren't able to do it. Right. You look at just kind of the, the difficulty of the Olympic tournament itself. Like I've said over and over and over again, it's a difficult game. And then I think also it's a good reminder that broad strokes conclusions off of one tournament aren't always going to be exactly the same or exactly play out, right? So there was a lot of talk after the World Cup last year that the NWSL, it's too transitional, it's too vertical. There, you know, those players are never going to succeed in a major tournament. Or there was the argument that, you know, the US was not developing players correctly, or the US needs to completely change their style of play in order to find success. Whereas I would say over the last two games, it's been but just some kind of true blue <laughs> US women's national team grit and guts that have gotten them through the knockout rounds. There there have been, you know, talks of, of Brazil not keeping up, or they had to have their coaching change. And I, I'll say that Brazil was definitely a wild card going into this tournament, but they have kind of gone in on all in on the NWSL. And a lot of those players are coming out of highly successful programs in, in the United States and them doing so well is, I think, a testament to how things are going in the Western Hemisphere as well. Plus the fact that this is a rematch of the Gold Cup tournament, which was a, a new tournament earlier this year and kind of sharpened these teams a little bit, sharpened them into the weapons that they became later in the summer You have the fact that the Olympic tournament is not a particularly good schedule for European teams. It might always favor teams who don't primarily play in Europe. I think all of these balances are really interesting and warranted and and just enjoyable to see play out where the traditional world football powers don't always don't always make it to the top. You can be the best team of a tournament and still not make it all the way to the to the final. And I, I just think it's a good reset. It's a good reset going into a number of years without a major world tournament. We'll see some more of, of the, the regional tournaments, obviously, in the future. But I just think it's a good good reset. And I, I think, again, what we saw from the United States today, what we saw from Brazil today, the throwback, you know, this is not the first time the United States has met Brazil in a gold medal match. It'll be the third. The U.S. prevailed in the other two. But but just, yeah, what... What a nice moment, I think, to to remind everybody that while things change, they also kind of stay the same. And it was fun for me to watch. So what does this mean for Saturday? What does this mean for Saturday? I don't know. So the bronze medal game is going to be on Friday. That's going to be between Spain and Germany. You would think Spain would bounce back on that one. Spain had a little bit of trouble with non-European competition in this tournament. Maybe an opponent they know a little bit better. They have a better handle on. Again, Germany has just been ravaged by injury during this tournament. I I really feel for Germany, and I think they've done quite, quite well for some of the fitness issues they were handed during these Olympics. You would think, again, you would think maybe Spain comes out on the front foot, but I don't know. That'll be an enjoyable game to watch. The bronze medal is real. Like That is a real medal to go for. I hope that both teams take it very seriously, because I think that's going to be a fun game to watch. And then U.S. versus Brazil. I will arguably, I think Brazil played better in their semifinal than the United States played in theirs. I think Brazil has a a heavy fitness advantage over the United States, and they're obviously getting Marta back. And I don't know. I I think it could be a really close game. I think you talk about sort of that lack of control where the United States relied very, very heavily on their defense in this game against Germany. Can they hold Brazil's attack off? That's like the next challenge, right? Right. Can the United States be more clinical in front of goal than Spain was? Spain had opportunities early in this match against Brazil to to right 
the the ship and kind of make the, the again the game state is so important when you're this tired to to get back on even footing and they just could never do it and can brazil's defense hold on they were able to against france they kind of started really leaking at in at the end of the spain game where they were lucky that they had the goal cushion that they had so I, I don't know. I don't know what happens, but I know for me, I'll just say personally, I'm I'm thrilled. I am so thrilled to to see Brazil play for a gold medal in, in Marta's final match with the team. I am thrilled by the United States turnaround, and I think we're going to get a heck of a bronze medal match between two of the best teams in the tournament in Spain and Germany. So it's been a really fun Olympics so far. I hope everyone else has been enjoying it, and we'll have more for you this weekend once those two games play out. Thank you all for listening. Like I said, it was a little bit more feelings-based, big picture, but what can you do? All that matters as you advance at this point. Just live to tell the tale with a medal around your neck. This has been a YouTube exclusive version of the late sub. You can subscribe to the audio version anywhere you get your podcasts. And if you're not subscribed to the Just Women Sports YouTube channel, highly recommend it. We've got great content coming your way. Have been for the entire Olympics. Going to have more coming next week. Shout out to my producer extraordinaire Parker Fenton, who has been doing strange hours with me throughout the whole Olympic Games. And we'll be back on Saturday to talk about who's going to win and who's going to go home maybe a little bit disappointed. Mm-hmm.